So we're going to cover pH just again. Uh, there's another video on pH on the channel that I'd love you to go look at. In fact, I think there might be two other videos on pH to get you familiar with it. But let me do a, a 30,000 foot overview of it for the purposes of our discussion of pH crash. pH crash happening pretty frequently, killing a lot of fish every year. Um, if you're prepared for it, it's a non sequitur. If you're not prepared for it, it'll probably get a collection. Um, so just a, in an encapsulation of pH, it's a measurement of free hydrogen in the system. And free hydrogen, come on, man, I'm going to make this simple. Free hydrogen can take the pH from acid to alkaline. And you may already be aware that fish, certain species of fish prefer acid and certain species of fish prefer alkaline and certain species of fish don't care. Some like it neutral. Here's my point. pH is a measurement and it's a measurement on a scale between acid and alkaline. A neutral pH is 7 pH of the bloodstream is 7.4, so we kind of want to keep our fish somewhere in between, uh, I don't know, 6.5, 6.8 for the acid lover fish, and we want to take them up to 7.8, 8.2 for the alkaline loving fish. It just kind of depends. You'd have to look it up, but manipulation of the pH is done with carbonates, and we're going to talk about those in a lot more detail in this discussion of pH crash. But suffice it to say, for the encapsulation of pH, it's a measurement. It's on a range of uh, acid to alkaline. Uh, alkaline is a higher pH, and acid is a lower pH. And the uh, problems that you run into is when the pH crashes. And what does that look like? Why does it happen? How does it happen? What can you do about it? How can you prevent it? Lots of questions. Uh, we can get started. So something to keep in mind, uh, there's two things I'll tell you to keep in mind. Uh, one of them is that anything that produces carbon dioxide, which is breathing for fish, decay processes by bacteria, decay processes on organic material like plants and fish and uneaten food and fish wastes produce carbon dioxide. Plants, live plants, half the time when they're in the sun, uh, they produce oxygen, consume carbon dioxide, but at night they do the reverse and produce carbon dioxide. So all biological processes, all organic living biological processes produce carbon dioxide. Okay. The second thing I need you to commit to memory is that the behavior of carbon dioxide in water is to form carbonic acid. Uh, that's just what carbon dioxide does, and there's no stopping it. Or is there? Actually, there isn't. When you put carbon dioxide in the water, it's going to form carbonic acid no matter what, but there is a way to keep that from happening to the detriment of the pH, and that dear friends, is carbonates. Carbonates will keep the pH from falling while everything in the environment is trying to drop the pH with carbon dioxide uh, and other processes too, but let's just keep our eyes on carbon dioxide and carbonic acid. The carbonates produce molecules that bind up that carbonic acid and keep it as bicarbonates instead of carbonic acid. And so uh, carbonates, when they're around, they have a tendency to fix the carbonic acid from dropping the pH. So if you think about it, carbonates are the Federal Reserve System. They're what backs up or supports your pH. Without carbonates, your pH could be all over the place because there'd be no exchange system to neutralize what the pH is trying to do. So carbonates, you might say, all right, tell me what I need to know about carbonates. Okay, where are they from? Carbonates come from compounds like baking soda, which is sodium bicarbonate, comes from crushed oyster shell, which is calcium carbonate, and limestone, such as dolomitic limestone, which, pro which provides you with magnesium and calcium carbonate. So there's lots of different places to find carbonates. 
um, probably in a fish tank, the best place to get carbonates is from a bottle of a buffer, um, neutral regulator. Uh, there's a variety of different um, types of, of buffers that work very well. Um, commercially available, and I'll probably drop a picture of a commercially available buffer, have a link in the description or something like that. I personally prefer neutral regulator, and I've said that a lot of times because I've used it for many years, and I don't care if it has phosphates in it because two things, phosphates make the best buffers, and two, um, phosphates feed my algae, and I like algae in my tanks, uh, at least on the back wall. Uh, at least enough for the Plecostomus to eat. So I don't see phosphates and algae as, the, as a very bad thing, but that's kind of a personal decision. It's neither here nor there. Um, so supplying carbonates to the system will stabilize the pH and keep it from falling under the pressure of carbon dioxide production, which forms carbonic acid, dr dragging the pH down. Okay. Is there a measurement for carbonate reserve? The answer is yes. It's the KH test the carbonate hardness test. And if you gave me a choice between measuring pH or carbonate hardness, and I had to pick one or the other, I would pick carbonate hardness. Carbonate hardness is the best predictor of pH behavior. And when your carbonate hardness is, say, 30 or above, or ideally closer to 70, but it can be a lot higher than that and not bother the fish. When your carbonate hardness is at a decent number, then you know your pH is probably going to be in a reasonably healthy, kind of close to neutral um, pH for most of the kinds of fish that we have a tendency to want to keep. Uh, discus breeder uh, would probably take exception to that, and somebody who keeps uh, brackish water fish would probably also uh, take exception because they like a higher pH. Um, but in general, uh, carbonate hardness of, say, 70 would be considered a very good number. 30 is on the low side and doesn't give you a lot of room before pH crash could happen. But uh, basically, the KH is the distance between you and the exhaustion of the carbonates and the crash of your pH. So the take home on that particular tidbit is if you know what your KH is, which is easy because it's on a dip type test strip, you just dip it in the water and it'll tell you what your KH is. If you keep your KH up with a buffer or calcium carbonate or magnesium and calcium carbonate, whatever, um, you're going to be a fair distance away from pH crash. What does pH crash look like? Well, here's the thing on that. pH crash is, is common and it looks like all the fish caught a disease at the same time. And pretty quickly, too. It's not something that really creeps up on you. It's the kind of thing that can happen overnight and actually usually does. Um, during the night, plant material produces carbon dioxide. You might remember during the day, plants use carbon dioxide and give off oxygen during the day. That's their respiratory phase or photosynthetic phase. I'm not a plant guy. At night, the uh, plants use oxygen and give off carbon dioxide. Well, as those plants at night are giving off carbon dioxide, they are joined in unison with fish giving off carbon dioxide. Lots of things giving off carbon dioxide at night. And so the pH has a tendency to decline at night. And if there aren't carbonates to stop it, then overnight the pH can drop out to, say, 5.5. So a lot of times in the morning you'll find your fish all huddled together and or dead and or flipping over and or covered with mucus because the pH has crashed, and maybe if you're not the kind of person to test these things right off the bat, you might not figure that out, and you might figure the fish have some sort of parasite and start dumping medicine into the system, which would be unfortunate because fixing a pH crash is a quickie. So the fish are all huddled, mucousy, dying or dead, uh, often first thing in the morning, um, and you check the pH, and it's, it's low overnight, um, it's fallen two points, let's just say, and that's enough to do a real number on the fish. And what's weird is that you could drop the pH two points and it'll 
kill or virtually kill your fish. But at that point, you can raise the pH two points, and the fish would thank you. So there's this urban... I'm not going to say it's an urban legend or a wives' tale, but there's this concept that you have to change the pH really slowly. I remember when I was a kid, it was like a quarter of a point per day till you get the pH to where you want it to be or something. And, and fish aren't that sensitive, uh, but particularly when the pH has crashed, you want to get that pH back up to where it needs to be as fast as you possibly can. Um, so... How would that be done if you've discovered a pH crash? Well, uh, we talked about carbonates being the buffer against pH crash, and that a pH of uh, round 7 is had when your carbonate alkalinity is up. So all you do in a pH crash is add carbonates. And to do that, it's uh, usually the fastest is either a commercially available buffer or baking soda. But there's a couple of rules on that. Actually, yeah a couple of significant rules on that, and of course they'll be highlighted on the presentation that you're watching, but first, when you apply the baking soda, you want to dissolve it in a glass of water or bucket or whatever is suitable for the uh, size of the system you're treating. You want to dissolve it as much as possible and then distribute it around the tank or pond. And then, and here's the key, then you're going to want to give your system an hour before you recheck the pH to see whether or not it's fixed or not. Because it takes a minute for the uh, carbonates to do their thing and bring the pH up. And if you check it 15 minutes later, a lot of times the pH is not corrected. And you'll go in there with more um, baking soda to bring up that pH and more. And by the end of the hour, you've added three times as much as you really needed to. So... Apply a recommended amount, which let's just say you happen to be using baking soda in a pond. I would recommend that you start off with one cup per 100 gallons. One cup of baking soda per 100 gallons of water in a pH crash situation. And distribute that around and then give it um, an hour or so to uh, uh, do its thing and then reassess whether the pH has come up. Um, if it's a buffer, commercially available buffer, it'll have instructions on it. In a small system, I would use something like a teaspoon per 10 gallons distributed, and then what checking again in an hour. Um, in a true pH crash in a fish tank, you're probably going to end up somewhere in the neighborhood of two teaspoons per ga uh, 10 gallons, uh, sometimes a tablespoon per 10 gallons, but I, I don't think so. Um, what if you add too much? Well, if you add too much for a minute, the pH is going to go up to 8, 8 point something. And you might say, well, does that matter? You know, does a koi or a goldfish or a, a, you know, a bunch of gouramis really care whether or not the pH goes to 8? And the answer is yes and no. What happens when the pH crashes is things become very inhospitable for the fish and for the beneficial bacteria. And so sometimes what you'll see is during a pH crash, the ammonia levels come up because your beneficial bacteria or your biological cycle uh, craps out a little bit. And when you see that, the ammonia levels come up. And somebody might say it's killed your beneficial bacteria, which actually isn't true. All the beneficial bacteria are doing is waiting for the pH to come back up. And then they resume their function, which is great. So... The, but the problem is that when you have a high ammonia level during a pH crash and you alkalinize the pH, it makes that ammonia a little more toxic. So watch closely. Get the pH back up, but try not to get it too high, which is why I'm having you wait an hour, check your pH before you add more uh, baking soda or buffer. But have faith that once the pH is back where it needs to be, that ammonia level is going to cycle back down to where it is supposed to be because those beneficial bacteria, they don't usually wait very long before they start doing their job again. But watch that to make sure that the ammonia levels do go down and or manage that with water changes or however you would normally choose to manage ammonia levels if there's a problem. Another consideration when the pH crashes is a visual, a visual sign that the pH has crashed, and there's a good one. If your water is green, like there's a green tint or it's green water in the pond or tank or 
uh, although most people don't tolerate green water in fish tanks, sometimes they do. I used to do that for surgery patients, preferring uh, like a green water for the uh, recovering patients because it's healthier water, but it makes it monitoring the fish harder. Uh, when the pH crashes in green water, the water turns to a mustard color. It's a terrific, terrific visual indicator that the pH has crashed. If you wake up in the morning and your green water has kind of gone to a, a, a greenish mustard color, you can you know right away what happened. And uh, check the pH, confirm, and then start bringing that pH back up. But um, So long-term management of pH to keep it from falling uh, is not best done with baking soda because sodium bicarbonate or baking soda doesn't stay in the system very long. It has a tendency to be exhausted pretty quickly, and it doesn't have a reserve because, in general, sodium bicarbonate dissociates and does its thing, and there's no repository for those carbonates. It doesn't stick around. A couple things that do is oyster shell crushed coral, and commercially available buffers. The reason crushed coral does so well is because it goes in as, uh, not crushed coral, crushed oyster shell. The reason crushed oyster shell does so well, uh, well, and crushed coral, is because those dissolve to do their job. So right then, when it's not needed, those compounds don't dissolve. When carbonates are acceptable, the crushed oyster shell or the crushed coral do not dissolve anywhere near as much. But if the water is starting towards uh, acid, there's a lot of carbonic acid produced in a round, um, you'll see that the oyster shell dissolves and releases calcium and carbonate activity and keeps the pH in a neutral range, which is awesome. I like crushed oyster shell quite a bit. Uh, and then there are caveats to its use. Uh, for example, it needs to be in the pathway of water, uh, somewhere in the filter or the waterfall or someplace where water is forced to go through the oyster shell. Uh, otherwise, it won't have the exposure to dissolve. You can use a lot less oyster shell in a canister filter than you could if you just threw a 60-pound bag of crushed oyster shell on the bottom of a usual pond. Uh, if you can force water through the crushed oyster shell, it increases dissolution as needed and maintains the pH better. Crushed coral does a similar thing, except that crushed coral is less than a third as active as crushed oyster shell. Uh, and then, of course, the commercially available buffers have those compounds in them um, and do a good job of remaining around. Uh, there's some very good commercially available buffers out there that sustain the pH in the neutral range for a long time, and, and those are great. Um, so there's kind of, you know, the commercial people and the do-it-yourselfers, and everybody finds their level. So supporting the pH will prevent pH crash from happening, and when you see pH crash happening, you need a quick fix, which might be baking soda, crushed oyster shell or limestone, dolomitic limestone, Crushed coral uh, could be long-term range, uh, long-range means of managing uh, the pH. And um, I think I might have covered everything at this point. That's a lot of information. There are videos on my channel about pH. There is uh, this one about pH crash. Of course, you can always re-watch a video if you want to become an expert on pH crash. You'll know more than you need to. Um, could have started the video off by saying, just put crushed oyster shell in your system, monitor your pH and your KH, keep your KH around 70, and you're good. But that kind of thing goes in one ear and out the other, unless you tell people the why, the when, the how, the what for, and all that. And I hope I haven't bored you too much. If I've forgotten something, please leave a message in the, in the comments. I check my comments fairly frequently, or at least right about now I do. And if I've forgotten something, I'll either edit the video, add to the video, replace the video, or we'll just leave it in the comments to help people out, which is pretty much what I'm trying to do. And uh, I appreciate your patience. Please like the video so people can find it easier and subscribe so that you're alerted when something else is released that you might be interested in. And I thank you for your time.